Hello everybody and welcome to my second workshop on how assembly works and how to get started with uh, the exercises and everything. So first of all, the systems I'm going to be using are uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux as well as uh, VI as my text editor. So for this, uh, I'm going to assume you already have Windows Subsystem for Linux itself installed, but the rest is all fresh from start. So it's like you gotta turn it on somewhere in the registry, but that's all in the lab manual. I will link to that in the um, in the other assembly chalkboard channel as well. So um, let's go to the Microsoft Store and install Ubuntu. So here we go, Ubuntu. Get. So I'm gonna start off with a fresh installation, just like you guys should. Or at least probably will be. If you got, of course, another app going, then that's totally fine too. But then I can show you how to like get everything going in the way that um, I did as well. I'm gonna keep it all on this one screen, so everybody on Twitch and uh, the Discord can follow along as well. It's uh, taking its sweet time to download, but that's logical because I'm downloading an entire operating system. So let me go into the background of this real quick. Uh, the operating system that I'm currently working on, like the one that I'm streaming on, using Discord on, is uh, Windows, Windows 10 to be precise. I think you all realize that. However, you cannot work very well with Windows itself, um, uh, with running assembly code and executables. So, so you've got to um, you've got to use a subsystem of uh, Linux on Windows. Windows subsystem uh, for Linux, and that will basically create a tiny, um, yeah, computer running Ubuntu. I think it works like a virtual box. I'm not entirely sure, but it'll probably create a tiny computer like uh, running an another operating system, which will be Linux, uh, which is not Windows, um, in the background, which you connect to. So it's an installing. This might take a few minutes. That's all good. Uh, let me already start a web browser uh, here, so that, that I can use in a bit. So here it says, uh, "Enter new Unix username." I'm gonna make uh, make the screen a little bit little bigger. So I'm gonna call uh, this user Yura, which is my name, and I'm gonna give it a password, uh, like just Thor, whatever. It doesn't really matter what you pick because uh, if people have access to your subsystem, they're gonna have access to your computer already. Okay. So first of all, you're going to want to update your system. So sudo optget install. You can use either optget or install. Um, optget or just opt. sudo optget update. Uh, and that command basically means super user do. So uh, execute as administrator. Update my system. So here it's busy uh, installing everything. Gotta give it a while. Oh. Apparently it wasn't. Uh, then I can do sudo opt-get upgrade. I don't know the difference between these two. Oh yeah, so update will uh, get all the new uh, like places where you can get packages, and upgrade will update the packages themselves, I think. But you just want to make sure you've done this so that everything you uh, that everything you want is uh, working. Let me see if I can get a copy of the lab manual itself running. So, uh, give me a second. You should be able to find this online, but I've got a, an online download of it. Um, computer organization, the lab manual. Okay, so I've got the manual here as well. And that's gonna say some stuff for uh, installing Windows subsystem for Linux. This is what you're going to be doing, so you're going to want to, uh, yeah, get all of this, and then you can continue on with uh, with the stuff that I'm doing. The word says indeed as well. Sudo up, get upgrade, uh, update, upgrade, and then um, install build essentials on GDB. So we're going to do that next. Sudo up, get install build essentials GDB. Um, I'm done. Build essential GDB. And then I'll ask, can we use this? Yes, you can. 
Now it's going to download it, uh, everything, and it's going to install everything. So the things we just downloaded are GCC, or a combination of build utensils that contain GCC and uh, GDB. And there's um, there's a uh, there's a few things here. So GDB is the GNU debugger, which is just a way to debug your programs. And um, build essentials is just the way to compile your programs. Okay, so now if I do uh, for example vi in.s, I'm gonna I'm gonna mostly be working in a file called in.s because I'm gonna be making a little script that'll um, run in.s and uh, and compile it, assemble it into out uh, into just out, which is an executable. So in.s will be my assembly file. However, now if I type assembly uh, syntax here, and we'll get back to this in a bit, um, it doesn't look very nice. And that's because I don't have the proper uh, syntaxing yet. So here in the um, in the lab manual, it will say for vi. Um, first it says ensure that git is installed, so we can do that, we can say sudo op uh, git install git. Okay, cool, it's installed. And then we can copy this command, which basically just downloads the um, the vi gath, uh, which is the syntax we're using, uh, highlighter and install it. So we can just copy paste this in here. And now we should have proper highlighting, so if I now do vi in.s. There we go, that looks a lot better. Ah, okay, so I'm gonna explain what VI is now it works in a bit. I first need to set up one quick more thing, and that is called Pwn Debug. Pwn Debug is a really, really useful uh, add-on to GDB, and that's what you're gonna be using to, um, to, uh, yeah, to debug your programs. So basically, you Google Pwn Debug, go to the first link, which will be a GitHub. There it says how. You can copy this. Oh shit, I copied something else real quick. Excuse me. And then paste it. And this will uh, execute some stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's getting a lot of stuff because it's uh, a proper add-on. I think they haven't updated GDB in quite a while and this like really makes it a lot more manageable without this uh, without the same amount of commands. But yeah, it looks it looks all hackery. I could turn the the screen to a green background, black uh, green foreground, black background if you guys want, and make it even more hackery. Uh, okay, so now we've got the if I if I start up GDB, it will say loading up Pony Bug Pony Bug as a shell. That's good. So I think we've got everything ready to code. So um, I'm gonna like show how you make programs first here, and then uh, after that I'm gonna go through some programs that I wrote already. I already went through these programs as well uh, in my earlier session, but I uh, can't be asked to copy them over from my other uh, thing to here. So I'm gonna be um, using the yeah the other subsystem that I already uh, use on the daily. But for now. Um, here I did, a f uh, I did a few commands, for example I see that I'm in the, the folder Pwn Debug, but I don't want to be in the folder Pwn Debug, I want to be in the I want to be in the folder Home slash Jure, which is where you usually start out. So I did uh, ls, which is like list files, and I will show what kind of folder, uh, what kind of files are there. I thought, okay, this is not the files I want, so I did cd uh, dot dot, which is change directory dot dot, and that means um, go to the directory before. So here, um, First I was in Pwn Debug, so I went out of that directory in this one. Um, yeah, I think that's everything we need to get going. Uh, this is a real neat shortcut that I would recommend you guys uh, use and make use of, uh, or uh, make and make use of when uh, you're going to do assembly. So, um, first of all I'm going to use VI again. And VI is a, a text editor, like Sublime Text or... Um, yeah. Any other text editor you would you would use? Um, it's not quite a be beginner friendly, but it's really useful because you don't have to copy files over from your main system, namely Windows, to the subsystem uh, the Ubuntu, which is really annoying if you have to do that every time you compile some stuff. So, um, 
Uh, this one is when you Google Pwn Debug, P W N D B G. It'll um. It's the first thing that shows up. So I'm gonna send it in the thing as well. Okay. So then uh, you can vi, and that's like my text editor, uh, a command called compile.sh, and compile will compile my in.s file to the out, dot, uh, out executable that we want. So I'm gonna take the um, the not for both one. So this is a uh, what an example of a good uh, compilation command. So it has GCC. It's not a PIE. So uh, uh, basically, it's not a Windows executable. I think uh, minus G for debug flags um, and minus O for this is going to be the output file and then your input file. So then I can go uh, GCC minus no pi. Unfortunately, we cannot get pi guys. Minus G minus O out in the S. And it might look weird, but basically, uh, that's just a syntax thing that doesn't understand uh, bash. Um, but this command, when I run it, it will compile my assembly file in.s to an executable file out. And that's the difference. You can run out, but in.s uh, in is just a file that contains some text. You cannot execute that. So then, and this is important, I have to say chmod. Uh, plus x compile.sh and all that command does is um, change it so that I can execute the compile.sh command um, yeah because I want to be able to execute it um, if I'm going too fast or you cannot see any of the um, commands I'm typing the stream will be uploaded as well uh, to YouTube and I will um, yeah, okay, you can uh, you can look back at them now, but if you have any questions during the stream as well, feel free to ask because other people can uh, profit from that as well. Okay, so now I can do dot slash compile dot sh and it will compile in dot s to an executable out. Um, right now my uh, my out won't do anything because I haven't done anything. But oh, but now I can run my file with dot slash out and it will not do anything because I didn't tell it to do anything. Okay, so now on to the assembly itself. Uh, first off, I'm, I'm using VI or Vim. Um, and Vim is a little bit of a special program as you cannot instantly edit stuff. If I press backspace now, it doesn't do anything. So you have to press I for insert. And then you can, uh, then you can program, type all your stuff you want. And uh, yeah, then you can press escape again. And escape will uh, go out of insert, so I is insert, escape is go out, and so you c uh, in that way you can like program some stuff, so uh, mold zero into RDX, whatever, uh, and then escape will bring it back out of the uh, the menu or the the insert mode, and then with colon you get like the this little command line on the bottom, you can get colon WQ, that means colon write and quit, so now the file in.s will be saved and I can check the content with cut which is a file to uh, yeah to read a, uh, a command to read a file and you'll see this is the content of my in.s file on to assembly oh. so um, we've got a few uh, a few things here before the main in the main that's where the magic is gonna be happening that's where you uh, where all the um, yeah that's where all the magic is gonna be happening but first we've got a few things we need to declare First we have to declare that this, everything under this, will be the text section. And the text section of your executable is read only. So if you're trying to write to it, won't work, no bueno. But this is where you, all your code is going to be, all your variables are going to, or like your, um, your strings are going to be that you're going to print out, that you're going to use for, um, uh, yeah, for scanf or printf or whatever but you will not be able to put a buffer here that you will change with for example scanf to do that you gotta give it a data segment we're not going to be using that yet so for now everything in the text segment is fine but keep that in mind then here we've got a label main and this label basically says okay my main function is going to be everything below this until the red and then um, we want our compiler the program that compiles it from assembly 
into um, into an executable to be able to access our main function. And we do that by saying global main, which is basically exporting our main so that the compiler can use it. Okay, first step when you make a program. I don't care what kind of program it is. I don't care what you're doing. When you're making a program, make sure to have a proper function prolog. And a function prolog is something that will um, that will align the stack and make everything ready for you uh, to use. Whenever you've got a subroutine or a function that you will call, you need to make a function prolog. If it's just a label that you will jump to, no function prolog needed. And no, you cannot just say, oh, but main is now a label and I won't call it. Well, you won't, but the other people uh, in the, uh, the, the compiler will. So you got to give this a proper prolog. And a proper prolog would be uh, enter zero, zero. The prolog itself is, uh, is a lot more complicated. It's like push uh, rbp uh, mov r uh, rb uh, rsp to rbp it's um and then subtracting an amount from rbp or rsp but this is a shortcut which is literally exactly the same um and yeah it's, it's a little bit more neat so if you want to know more on uh on function prologues uh the actual wikipedia uh, page of it has uh the bigger version as well as it added it in the lab manual if i go prolog um let me see where it is. Oh yeah, well they don't give a proper example here except for here. Yeah, so this is the prologue as they would use it. But I just use enter because uh, that's a little little neater, a little faster. Your function also gotta have an epilogue. Now this probably won't happen if you're calling if you plan on calling exit, but if you want your subroutine to gracefully leave it, you gotta write uh, this um, this little uh, epilogue at the end. I'm gonna edit my. I'm gonna comment my code as well. I'm doing that with two slashes or a hashtag. You can use either of them. I'm gonna be probably using two slashes, but I'm gonna be using hashtag as well. I'm not very consistent in my life. And um, so here I'll say function prolog, and here I'll put function epilog. Okay, we're done. We are ready to code. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At every uh, at every subroutine. So, for example, if I hear of a subroutine called pow that I'm going to be calling, as a reference to the thing, you're going to have to uh, enter zero zero, uh, leave uh, get. So every subroutine's got to have this. Even like they left it out in the terminal or in the in the uh, manual because they call exit. But honestly, I just leave it in because it is uh, it can be a reason your program sec fault if you don't have uh, in uh, and if you don't have a proper uh, exit in between somewhere. Okay, so now we're ready to um, yeah to get started with it. So the basis of assembly is there are a few registers. And with those, uh, with those registers are basically going to be your quote-unquote variables in assembly. Um, you can move stuff around those registers with mov. You can see sometimes the menu using mov-q, but mov and mov-q are practically the same if you're using uh, the register that I'm using, namely rax, rbx, rcx, rdi, rdi. So all the normal registers, mov and mov-q are the same because uh, you move a quad word or a byte, I think. Yeah. So basically, I can say move uh, zero, oh, 0 into RAX. And that's, that's basically the syntax you're going to be uh, using often. I often prefer to say into. So it is first the number you're going to be moving and then the register. And as you can see, numbers are denoted with a dollar sign in front of it. And register names are denoted with a percentage sign in front of it. So here I can say I'm moving 0 into REX, I'm uh, moving 1 into our DX, I'm, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, so this is the, the basis of the move command. You can also move uh, register, so I can say move the content of our AX into our DX. 
So now both of the registers will have zero in it. Um, okay. Then we can start getting started on a Hello World program. So first of all, I'm going to need to define my string somewhere. Um, you cannot just say, ah, lol, string. You got to say, okay, my string named, I don't know, hello. Um, this is going to be a uh, just a, an address in memory. That's basically all you're doing with the assemb uh, assembly file. You're writing stuff into memory, and your computer then tries to make sense of that. So you're going to say, this region in memory contains the ASCII characters. And ASCII is just uh, a fancy way of putting letters into numbers. Uh, that's like the, stand the standard agreement that everybody agreed to use. And then say, uh, hello world. And then backslash n to uh, add a nice new line to it. However, this isn't just it. You're going to have ASCII V. Because what ASCII V does is it puts a zero byte at the end. Just a byte that's full of zeros. And um, yeah, that's the way that printf, the function we're going to be using to print stuff to the screen, knows, hey, I'm done. So now we can go on and um, call printf with uh, hello. However, it's not that easy in um, in uh, assembly. In assembly, we've got to uh, uh, move the, f uh, the, um, the parameters of your function into certain registers. And what registers are that you gotta use is documented in here, uh, in the uh, calling convention. So here you can see, oh, okay. Here you can see when passing parameters to functions, and of course this could be random, but just a bunch of people sat down and, and agreed that to this. So uh, your first argument is going to be an RDI, your second argument is going to be an RSI, your third argument is going to be an RDX, and there's like a bunch more, but you n almost never use anything more than these three. So the first um, argument to printf is going to be the address of hello, which is in memory. So we're going to move, and this sign in front of a label means the address of. We're going to move the address of hello uh, into rdx. And then we're going to call printf. And then we're going to leave. So this is it. This is your hello world program. And now, lo and behold, I'm going to get a segmentation fault. I don't hope so, but chances there. Oh, oh, hey, it works. <laughs> nice. Okay, so now what compile did, as a reminder, compile compiles the in.s, the assembly file in.s, to an executable out. So now we've got a file here called out that we can run with dot slash out. Segmentation fault. All right, I, uh, I was a little too early in my, um, my happy shouting. So I'm gonna try something real quick. Hmm? Hmm? Is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Good call. I'm not sure about the dot text one, but that could also be, be something. So now I'll run this and I'll see if it works. It works. You both were right. Okay, so as I have been corrected now, thank you very much, guys. Uh, you gotta have dot text instead of text colon, and the first argument is RDI, then RSI, then RDX. My bad. Okay, so now we have our first uh, our first printf. Hmm? Um, by convention, yes. However, I haven't ever gotten an error because I didn't, and I almost never do it. I, I think, I'm, I'm not quite sure, it's it's about vector arguments, so it's basically like, hey, uh, there are some uh, some registers that you can use for more precise numbers or larger lum numbers, and, and REX is basically a way of communicating like, hey, uh, the next few registers will be used for those instead of from here. Um, so you can, uh, you can indeed make sure that they, uh, those arguments or those registers are being used by moving zero into REX. However, I have not yet found a um, a case a scenario where it doesn't. Now I'm going to enter some. Hmm? I mean, I, I use RAX in my programs quite often. 
to like have a counter or whatever. So in, I don't actually think my think my RX is always zero, but we'll see. I'm gonna I'm gonna do some uh, some more stuff here. So I'm gonna uh, move zero X sixty nine into uh, RBX. I'm gonna move um, zero X FF into RCX. This is just also arbitrary stuff so that I can show you guys. Um, so I can show you guys how uh, GDB works in a bit. So, uh, for example, move uh, 15 into R, uh, R AX, and then I can say mull uh, R CX. Um, so basically, I've I've added a few commands here, uh, and there's a difference between uh, in here that that's uh, quite nice to point out. Here we've got 0x69, and then we'll actually uh, put the hexadecimal number 69 instead of the decimal number uh, 69 into RBX, and this is just 15, so that's just 15 decimal. In hexadecimal, it will be 0xf. Uh, what hexadecimal and decimal is and binary is, I will get back to that later, but this is just to uh, show some stuff. So now I can compile this, I can run it, the things that I did. Do, do not change anything like these few things but I do want to have it because now I'm going to show you guys how to debug a program so we just uh, installed pwn debug before and here you can see gdb uh, and then you, the file you're going to debug so gdb out out is my executable file so it's going to start up load all the stuff in from pwn debug and um, then you you've got a terminal you can do you can do this there the command you're going to be using is start and start basically says, okay, let's start uh, from the beginning of my program and walk through it together. I'm going to turn my font sound design a bit, uh, size down a bit because I want you guys to be able to see everything that is going on. So let me uh, quit my terminal real quick. Um, restart it. GDB. Is this still readable for you guys? All right, awesome. So, uh, when you say start, it's going to give you a bunch of information. Uh, that information is stuff, in, uh, in the registers, the disassembly, the source code, the stack and the backtrace. Now from top to bottom, these are all the registers and what they are currently loaded as. Uh, the, comp the compilation program did some stuff with, uh, with the registers beforehand, so you cannot assume these are zero when you start the program. As you see, there's a lot of registers that aren't zero that you cannot uh, that you yeah you cannot just assume they are. Then we've got the disassembly, and the disassembly is when you don't have, for example, the input file. It will try to disassemble your uh, the output file into readable code uh, so that you can still go through it. This is really cool because that means that if somebody else wrote a program and you want to um, and you want to figure out how it works, you can just use GDB. And see uh, and see just how it works in the assembly code that made it. And then below that you've got the source code. So this is just uh, from the file that uh, that we wrote just now. And here we've got the stack. And the stack is uh, it's something I will get back to later. But it's paid, uh, I don't have to. Uh, right, it's not that relevant now. And then the backtrace. And the backtrace is just which functions are we in and um, what yeah what what are the functions uh, that we're currently in. So we're currently in libc start main and then after that we jump to main which is all that you're yeah, that you guys care about because main is just all you're going to be uh doing okay so there's a few instructions now the most important ones being si and ni and sei is step into ni is next instruction so for now you can get away with just using ni but basically, SI is when your uh, when your pointer, like this green arrow, is standing on an, on a uh, call function, and you don't want to step over it. You want to step into it to see what's going on inside of that call function. So, for example, if I were to ni and I uh, next instruction, next instruction, next instruction to the call function of printf, and I would call SI here, I would go into the printf function and look how printf works. I don't want to do any of that. I'm not interested in how printf works. I just know it works. And then you can do ni, and it will step over it to the next instruction. Um, okay, so it printed the um, it printed hello world. Let's see here, and uh, then it went through the function, so it did everything, and now it's gonna end. Program is exited. 
So now I can say start again, and now we're going to walk through it real quick. So um, the enter, here you can see, before the enter, the base pointer was somewhere completely different from the stack pointer. Um, and here we've got the base pointer um, pushed onto the stack somewhere, and the stack pointer and the base pointer uh, being set to each other. So this is what the function prolog does. But for the rest, uh, all your registers are still the same except for RSP, RBP, and RIP. Now, these three registers, the base pointer and the stack pointer, these two are used for um, for keeping track of the stack. For uh, If you haven't seen this, uh, or how the stack works, I recommend you guys check out my other video that will also be on YouTube about how the stack works. And our IP is the instruction pointer, and that points to the current instruction uh, that is being executed. So this is basically, literally, um, where is my program now? And here it's saying uh, it's, a, it's a main plus four, which is the first mob instruction, because we just executed the first enter. So now you can see, uh, if I do next instruction, the next instruction will be moving 0x69 into RBX. You can see here, uh, RBX change, that's the little star sign here, and 0x69 is now in RBX. Next instruction is 0xff into RCX, so you can see that's in there as well. And then it's going to move 0xf, which is 15, into RAX. So these are just three things that we just uh, did, and then it's going to call multiply on RCX. And um, in the lab manual, there's this really neat table that shows that basically says what uh, what instructions do. So here we've got the multiply instruction, and it says, okay, RDX colon RAX, AX, which is basically a way of saying usually only RAX, but if the number is big enough, it's going to overflow into RDX uh, equals to RAX times source. So you're basically just doing RAX equals RAX times whatever you're specifying. So here we've got uh, RAX being F, RCX being FF, and those two will be multiplied by each other when I do next instruction. And here RAX is 0x EF1, and we can check here with Python um, to see real quick that uh, 0xff times 0xf is a number, and then when we take the hexadecimal value of that, that is 0xef1. So that's correct. It also made rdx0. That's something you gotta watch out for, especially in your first pro and your first assignment. Rdx will be set to zero if you do a multiplication. It will be set to another value. Uh, if your multiplication is big enough, but it's not going to be what it was before. Okay, so now we can do a few, a few next instruction calls. So this one moved 0 into RAX, which was what we just discussed a few minutes ago. And the next one is going to move the address of hello into RDI. So here you can see, RDI is an address 0x401126, uh, which we have called hello. And here you can see, okay, that is hello world slash n. And there's also a command in uh, Pwn debug, which is um, show me what is at this uh, address in memory. So I can say, okay, um, sorry for my notification, by the way. Um, show me what is in memory. Give me uh, one string uh, and then B for bytes, which will make a lot more sense when we're looking at, uh, at bytes being stored in memory. But for now, you can just trust me on this one. And you can see 0x. Uh, 401126, that's our uh, argument. And here, that's another cool feature of uh, GDB. It will here say, what is uh, your, uh, what are your arguments? Hmm? Oh, yeah. That's all right. Okay, so, um, this is usually how you would call printf with a format string and an argument string. That's not how we're doing it now, so it doesn't exactly match, but it's what it's guessing. But you can see the first argument is a pointer pointing to hello world. So now if, uh, if we say, show me the first string starting at this address, which is the address where hello world is stored, it will also show here, yeah, that's hello world. So you could even say, uh, show me the hexadecimal, uh, like, I don't know, 20 hexadecimal bytes of that address. And this here is hello world, but then in the values that it is actually stored in memory. So H, E, L, L, you can see these are the same. O, space, this is a space, I can recognize that character. World, and then uh, the enter. And this is the um, 
zero byte. And a zero byte uh, is what we did again with OSCII zero. OSCII is where uh, it knows for, uh, for like, okay, I gotta stop reading here. Okay, so now that we know that, we can say next instruction and we can see it has printed hello world to the terminal. Okay, cool. So that is all um, for this program. Now I'm going to switch back real quick to my Kali machine, which is the machine I usually work with. Um, and let's see, I currently have an in.s. I'm not going to check what is in there, uh, because that could be code that will be used in an assignment. And I don't want to uh, get called by Andy like, hey, you're doing fraud. So I'm going to move that. I'm going to make my font a little bigger, so you guys can watch along a little easier. And, um, okay, yeah, so, I have got some examples uh, in the assembly folder, so I can say ls assembly flash, and I will just say, okay, what is, um, what files are in the assembly folder? Um, these files are what everybody's interested in. I'm not going to show them. I've got a few other files, like ctf.s, hello world.s, and scanf.s, that we're we are going to look into. So, move assembly slash scan print uh, scan print.s to in.s and that's just saying copy that file to uh, in.s so now in in.s we've got some um, some stuff here so this file has still got some old stuff okay so we are again saying uh, to say main is a global it will be um, you know so that the, the compiler can execute it then we are making a buffer in the data segment and it's important that data segment is read writable so you can read from it and you can write from it and write to it that's important because if you try to put your buffer in text which is read only when you call scanf it will try to write to it and that will not work so then in the data we skip 30 which is basically saying reserve 30 bytes for my um yeah for my buffer these bytes will be initialized with zeros and uh, it will be just usable for you and then in the text thing we've got a format string which is percentage s which i'll get back to and then a main function okay so this percentage s is something we use in uh, scanf and printf and that basically means interpret the next um yeah whatever we're giving to you as a string so um here i'm using it for uh for printf and that will uh take the memory in uh or the yeah, the value of memory that we are using um, as a buffer, and it will interpret that as a string and push it to the to the stack. You can also have, for example, uh, os oscz percent l or percent d, and this will mean um, read my input as a number and store it as a number and print my output as a number. But for now, we're not working with numbers; we're working with uh, strings. So. Um, what we're doing here is again with the dollar sign or the yeah the dollar sign we're moving the address where our buffer is into RSI the second argument and then the format which is the um, percentage s into the first uh, argument and then calling scanf scanf is um, a function that will take your input and store it somewhere in memory and then say okay use that buffer as your output again interpret it as a string and call printf. So this uh, this program isn't all that all that big or important. All it does is it uh, takes my R input and prints it out again. So I can compile it, I can call it, and I can say ABC123, and it will print ABC123. As we say in Dutch, a kind kan de was doen. So now we can um, we can actually look at this in GDB and see what exactly it is doing with the um, with the buffer. So we can say start, uh, and here we can see the buffer, which is at zero x. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna read from the buffer. Let me get that straight first. So I'm gonna say 30 bytes, which is how long our buffer is. And we're gonna say hexadecimal bytes uh, from our buffer, zero x four zero four zero three eight. Those will all be zeros. That's the buffer is, uh, is always zeroed out at the beginning if you put in the data. So then we move, oh yeah, I um, 
Wait, was I already at goal? Okay, so it's expecting me now to input an, uh, a, a string, I think. So I'm just gonna say a a a a a a a a b b b b b b b b. Enter. What? I'm gonna try that again. That that was not what I uh, what I wanted. So if I do next instruction, why is it already? Oh, okay. Let me see. So if I do S I, yeah. Okay. So for some reason, when you're on an enter statement and you do next instruction, it will just finish the entire function. That's not what you want. So on an enter statement or a call statement, you should do uh, step into S I instead of next instruction. So now we can say next instruction, next instruction, and we can see um, the format string, namely percentage s, is loaded into uh, the, f the format argument, and the buffer, which is now still zero, is loaded into the um, into the var arg argument. So like the thing that's gonna be uh, gonna be changed by scanf, yes. Oh, this one. Yeah, that is uh, that is correct because it is not walking through our source code, but it is walking through the actual assembly program. And uh, yeah, the enters yeah the programmer uh, the compiler doesn't really care for that. So this is just a representation of what should be happening, but all the magic is happening up here in the disassembly. However, you cannot just uh, read the disassembly and think that you can actually read it because it's uh, the Intel syntax instead of the syntax we're using so that's why it looks a little weird but yeah okay so now we're calling scanf with as a uh, format argument our percentage s that will say read this as a string and the buffer is currently zero which we can check again with this it's all zero now we say next instruction important here next instruction not step into because otherwise we're going to step into the scanf uh, function and that will let us enter a string. So we'll call a a a b b b b. Um, and now our memory, our buffer, will contain those values, and we can check that. So we can say again, print thirty bytes uh, as starting at this area, and we can see zero x forty one forty one forty one forty one forty two forty two forty four forty two, and that's the values for capital A and capital B. Um, we can also, again, like we did earlier, say give me one string instead, and it will say a a a b b b b. So now we will move the address of that buffer into RSI and the format string again into RDI, the next instruction, next instruction. And now you can see, okay, it's gonna print a string, and the string here is um, the buffer a a a b b b b, next instruction. And it did like above there, so it doesn't show it. And then we leave. And there we go. Oh, there it is. We didn't print an enter, so sometimes uh, it doesn't show up. If if there is no enter, it will not immediately show your code. It will only like process everything at the next enter. It's just the way uh, buffers and, uh, and like uh, the standard output works. Okay, so that's it for the um, for the outs uh, for the. Um, for the scanf printf example, we are already on to our last example of the batch, which will be a little CTF. And to give a little bit of background information, a CTF is a capture the flag, and it's basically just um, a challenge where you have to find a flag, and you have to enter it somewhere, and it'll give you points. So um, if I cp assembly slash ctf.s into in.s we will now have the assem uh, the uh, file here um, before I continue I will go into uh, Excel real quick to show a bit of the difference between uh, decimal, hexadecimal and um, binary so uh, let me see if I can zoom in a bit and binary so decimal you guys already know decimal but you just might not know it decimal is just our normal system so 0 to 9 and uh, 9 yeah 
I get really bothered by the way it fell works. Um, hexadecimal goes a little further than that. Oh yeah, uh, you cannot enter a zero at the beginning of a string. Um, hexadecimal goes a little further than that. And hexadecimal works with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But it wants some more, so it goes A, B, C, D, E, F. And it also has a zero. And this, in total, is 16 different um, different characters. So decimal is a 10-based system, hexadecimal is a 16-based system, and binary is a 2-based system. And binary's got only 1 and 0. So, um, you guys have already probably heard that computers work with 1s and 0s, it's just 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, whatever. Um, that is correct, and that's also how it stores, how it stores data, how it processes data. But for humans, it's not really recognizable. So if I see, uh, hey, you've entered this value, this value is what you entered, this really helps, then I don't honest to God know what the hell is there. So uh, we invented hexadecimal. And hexadecimal is a 16 base system, it's a power of 2. We denote it with, by starting our number with 0x, so 0x16 will be the hexadecimal number 1, 6. Um, and just like in decimal, you've got a system where, uh, for example, 100 means that the 1 there is, uh, is word, or word in a way, 10 squared, uh, yeah, how do you say that, points in a way. So when you look at a number in uh, any base system, so binary, decimal, or hexadecimal, you can take the base and mult uh, and do that to the power of the position uh, and that's how much that will be worth which sounds really complicated but all that means is that this one is worth 10 to the power 0 or 0 this one is worth 10 to the power 1 so 10 this one is worth 10 to the power 2 so 100 so if I have number uh, 265 that is 5 uh, times 10 to the power 1 which is just 1 plus 6 times 10 to the power 1 or I mean 5 to the power uh, 5 times 10 to the power 0 which is 1 6 times 10 to the power 1 and 2 somebody's reading in their mic times 10 to the power 2 so that is 5 plus 60 plus 100 is 526 in hexadecimal the system works the same so imagine we have the hexadecimal number uh, 25 that will be 5 times 16 to the power 0 which is 1 and then we plus that with 2 to the power uh, 2 times 16 to the power 1 so 32 so this is the heck uh, the decimal number 37 so if you're if you got numbers in memory and they don't seem to make sense try converting them between hexadecimal and decimal and that's just the way um, our debugger shows us this stuff so um, Yeah, let's have a look at our uh, CTF program real quick. So we've got the um, so we've got the program itself. Let me compile it real quick. We've got the program itself, and what does that do? When we run it, ask for a password. Um, so now we can just say enter a password like A B C D E F. Wrong. So the challenge here is to try to get the right password. And now you cannot uh, you cannot change the jump equal to a jump not equal at the end and just be done with it. We really got to figure out what the password is. So, to do that, um, we can look at... And now we've got a choice. Either I can show you the assembly code or the GDB uh, log. But I'm just going to show you the assembly code so, um, so you guys can understand assembly a little bit more. So here we've got a few things. We've, we're declaring the globe, uh, main is global again, so that the compiler can use it, logical. We've got uh, a buffer with 30, uh, 30 spaces free, 30 bytes free in this case for our input string. We've got a key here, which we don't know what this does yet. We've got uh, the my string, which is just uh, please enter the password, which will be printed at the beginning. Hmm? Uh, that can be that can be any number. I just wa I just wanted it to like. Um, oh no, that's like you're thinking about stack alignment, but um, that is something we work with uh, here. 
Uh, or that we don't work with work with here yet. That's what I meant to say. Um, but yeah, I I did this back when I didn't know uh, too much about stack yet. I recently like had the the coin fall, the kwartje gevallen. So I now understand understand it a lot more. So we'll go into a little bit more detail of that later. Um, but basically, yeah, we've got all these strings. We've got a formal string to print something as a string to take input as a string. And we've got these weird key bytes that are read-only that we don't know what they do yet. But that's all right. Um, okay, so looking through the program, we've got the enter, the prologue, obviously, uh, which reserves zero space on the stack. We've got, um, and that, that's something I forgot to tell you guys, but the first argument is how much space you should reserve on the stack. Now, honest to God, I have never used reserved space on the stack but um, when you see the vi the other video I posted in the USSMLE chalkboard, it will be a, lo be a lot more clear on um, on what that actually means. I, th I find it a lot easier to just assign a buffer in data and just use that uh, area if I need to store a string or a large number somewhere. Okay, so what we're doing first is we're moving my string into RDI, and my string is just again, uh, please enter the password, and then we're calling printf. Real simple, print step. Then we're, uh, we're taking our buffer, uh, putting the formal string in RDI, uh, and calling scanf, so that we already did this before last time as well. This will just put uh, whatever we enter into the buffer. So now we're using another art, uh, another thing that we've actually never heard, uh, heard before, called stringlen. And stringlen is a function that will um, see how long a string is. So it will basically look at the string we entered, see when is there a zero byte, or when is there an enter, and it will say, uh, it, will, it will see how long is that. So, um, the output of this function, which will determine how long our string is, is stored in REX. That's another thing that you can see from the calling convention. Um, by default, the, uh, let's see where that is. Uh, the return value by convention will le will be in the RAX registers. So um, RAX will after this function contain the length of our string. What we do here is we check, we compare the number nine, and it's an it's a one digit number. So in this case, I could just say nine or zero x nine. It doesn't really matter because they're both word one, uh, and compare that to RAX. So the length of the input string. And if that is not the case, so if the string is not nine characters long we jump to fail. And fail will just um, print incorrect and leave. Also, labels are nothing more than uh, a way for memory, uh, for your program to see where something starts, but it doesn't interrupt anything. So um, the program will naturally fro flow from main into loop, into label correct, into fail, into after, if there were no jumps or um, calls. However, we can see our first jump here already. That should test jump not equal, and then it'll, it'll go to fail. So now we're going to work with a loop. And this is the first time you guys have seen a loop. Now, in assembly, all loops resemble while loops. Everything is a while loop on a lower level. Uh, and the way this works is we've got the RAX register, and we're moving zero into that. Um, this will be our counter, our I, if you will. We check if RAX is 9. And if it is nine, we jump to label correct. We can also see here that we're incrementing RAX and then jumping back to loop. So our code will start out here with an RAX of zero. Compare if RAX is nine, it will not be. And here it says jump equal. So only if it's equal, we'll jump to label correct. But it, it is not, so we'll go on, do some shit. I don't know what, but then it will increase RAX. RAX will now be one and then jump back. Is it nine yet? No, so it does some more shit. It's uh, increased it, it's still jumps back, etc. 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 So, here you can see, um, so that's what all this code does, and now we've got this little bit of code. So, what it does here is it moves the address of buffer into R9 and the address of key, and the key was the, was the thing that we defined up here as to be some like 2a, 0x59, 0x7 uh, type shit. And then it will uh, it will load these addresses into um, into R9 and R8. 
now we're doing something fun. Because in um, in convention here, let me see if I can find it. Yeah. So basically, you guys are almost always working with RAX, RCX, RDX, etc. And these are all 8 byte long registers. But there are also smaller registers built in. So you've got like AL, AX, and EAX. And these are like the tinier sizes of uh, said registers. So if I were to give an example in, in here again, uh, I would go to the right a bit. So, um, is there a way to go and join cell cells quickly? Merge, uh, whatever. Um, so this is, all these bytes together are RAX. The last, uh, or wait, RAX is eight bytes. So we've got, uh, let me see if I can fit it all on my screen or I've got to make it a little, a little less big, a little less big. So all, oh, where the fuck am I? Okay, from start. So all these bytes, all, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All these eight bytes, and just imagine everything here is a byte, together forms RAX. Then these half byte, uh, half of this, EAX, will form EAX. Um, then these two bytes will be AX, and the very last byte will be AL. So what this practically means is it that, for example, you have a really big number that you you store like oh, Jesus Christ! If you have a really big number, like you store in all these um, in all this value, but you only want the last value of it, you can, for example, work with AL, and that will contain the last 25th uh, or uh, eight bits of that value. Also, something to mention: uh, I t uh, in binary we've got bits, which is either a one or a zero. So, for example, uh, one zero one zero one zero. Uh, or yeah like this this will be six bits and there's a group of eight bits together that's called a byte um, so REX is eight bytes or 64 bits long uh, EAX is only four bytes long AX is uh, eight, uh, two bytes and AL is just the last byte so as we can see we're working only with the last byte here so what we're doing now is we're moving MOV B which is move a single byte and we've got this weird structure. But all this weird structure does is it says take uh, take the value of um, and we've got like uh, A, B, C or let, let's say uh, base offset multiplier which will result in base plus offset times multiplier. A multiplier can only be 1, 2, 4 or 8. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking the start buffer and we're moving that in, in, in R9 and we're doing that plus Rx times 1. So basically what we're doing there is uh, buffer 0 then buffer 1 then buffer 2 and this is basically the way of indexing or addressing um, the end byte of a um, of a string or of a, bu or of a buffer or whatever. Um, okay, so here we've got the bracket, um, yeah, way of writing things, and which basically we've got base comma offset comma multiplier, and that will return the value at base plus offset times multiplier, and all that does here is it says okay the base is buffer, so for example that would be zero uh, x. Uh, four zero four zero one one two two or four zero one one two two. I don't I don't know what it was anymore. Plus uh, R E X is first zero, then plus one, plus two, plus three, um, and it will take the value at that address and load that into B L. And because our bytes are stored here in memory one by one, it will first take like key plus zero will point to this byte. Key plus one will point to this byte, key plus two will point to this byte, key point three will point to this byte, etc. And the same goes for the buffer. Buffer plus one will point into the first character of the buffer, second character of the buffer, third character of the buffer. So here we're busy modifying singular characters, or in this case, just getting them singular ver uh, characters into BL and CL. And BL and CL are both these um, 
these really tiny last bit, uh, last part of the buffers uh, that we're working with. Let me see if I can. Mm -hmm. um, well, in this case, we only want rex times one. But for example, say that you've got an array of uh, quads. So we've got like uh, quad, uh, I don't know, zero x. Uh, f, 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 f. Uh, I don't know if that's the right amount, but imagine we've got like four of these and they all differ by a bit or whatever. I don't fucking know. Um, but imagine the byte stuff wasn't there and we only got this. Then to get the next one, we wouldn't have to see the next byte because this already in itself is eight bytes. But we would have to check the byte eight bytes after that. So in that case, um, the multiplier would be 8 and then it would be um, like base would be for example 0x 4 4 uh, 4 4 uh, 4 0 1 1 2 2 and then plus 0 plus 8 plus 16 uh, plus 24 and that will just uh, that's just useful if you have uh, numbers with offset bigger than 1 for which you want to grab like a chunk of it I'm sorry if the, uh, that explanation wasn't as clear, but it's probably as clear as I'm going to get it because it's quite a difficult concept. I'm going to... Uh, somewhere else in memory, and where that is will be decided by the, um, by the compiler. And we can check for ourselves where that is in memory during execution with uh, the debugger that I showed you just now, where you can just see the memory. Or uh, see the see the program, what's being loaded and stuff. So I'm going to move 0 into uh, our... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I did like uh, 8, it would still only move a single byte, but that, that would mean that it would move... A single byte starting at uh, uh, buffer plus zero, buffer plus eight, buffer plus, and that's not that is not what you would want because in this case they would only pick like zero x f f zero x f f zero x f f. But yeah, mov b like what is behind the mov and what registers you're using is leading in what uh, in what you're going to be copying. So um, I didn't actually explicitly have to say mov b. Because if I, if I did this, it would still understand, okay, I'm moving it into a one byte register, so I only need to move one byte, but I'd like to put it in just to be clear. Okay. Um, so now this will move the buffer plus, uh, oh, the buffer plus rex into bl, and then the key plus uh, rex into cl. So for example, say uh, we've entered an a, that means uh, bl will contain 0x41, and say the, uh, what's the first value of the key? That's 0x2a. So CL, oh, CL will contain 0x2a. Then we XOR BL with 0x69. And XOR is, uh, you guys already had XOR, the exclusive OR. That's basically the, um, the weird plus in a circle. You guys had a uh, reasoning and logic. But it's basically a way of, um, of trans of uh, yeah, I wouldn't say encryption because it's not encrypted at all, but it's a way of like masking data, I guess. So, for example, if you have like uh, a XOR, so this is like the sign for XOR we use in programming, B, then it will be C, but then we can uh, XOR C with B uh, with B to get A again. So, this is like a reversible way of encoding things, and we can also do C x or a to get b so they will, they will like connect these three uh, values in a way so then bl will be xor and, and that's like our um, yeah that's our input value will be xor with 69 and then that will be compared to cl and if that's not the case then it will jump to fail when we failed and that is the case it will move on to the next iter iteration and if it gets all the way here all nine bytes without being incorrect so without jumping to fill a single time then we know it is correct we can move we can uh, we can jump here move correct into rdi print that so it prints like hey you're correct and you can jump to after so it doesn't print fail 
Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so if we didn't have this part, however, like the jump after, uh, it would jump to label correct, print correct, and then as per normal, go down into fail, because the fa the fact that here it says fail colon doesn't change anything, and then it would also print incorrect. So that's the reason why we're jumping to a label after the incorrect, and then it will just leave and exit. Um, print f prints whatever is in the RDI register, and that, that is with a, with a little asterisk behind it because it also works with format strings. So if you say like print f and then a percentage s, and then a string, it would also just work like that. Or if you say like percentage d and then like uh, a number, it would print the number as a string. But that's a, that's that's some format strings. I think there's a little bit of an explanation of format strings here. Um, uh, let me see. Should be around here somewhere. Yeah. So we've got like a decimal number, a string of characters, um, and like all kinds of different things that you can print using printf. There's a little uh, little head on it. Um, on 3.7.1 you can read it into. But yeah, so we know we now have a general idea of what our program does. So we've got, um, it'll enter, it'll print a string, scan a string, that will be our input. It will call string length, see if it's 9, if not fail. It will loop through the string, um, and it will compare the values to a key, XOR with 69. And uh, if, it, uh, if it doesn't find a fault in any of them, it will jump to correct, otherwise it will jump to fail, and then it will quit the program gracefully. Alright, sick. So now, I'm gonna do a little bit of magic, because I told you guys, uh, if we take the input with uh, with the key, or uh, XORT with 69, it should give the key. If we give uh, the key XORT 69, it should give the input. So, I'm gonna go here and take the first byte. That's 0x2a, and I'm gonna open Python real quick. 0x2a. Then we can say XOR 0x69, and then we'll give a character. Uh, and this character is hex uh, 87, uh, 68, and it is 0x43. And now we don't really know what 0x43 is because we can that's not a character. So we gotta convert that back to, uh, to ASCII, and Python's got a neat little command for that called char. So we know the first character is a capital C. Then the next one is. Um, Let's see, 0x59 x for that, and then we can just return the character that that gives, and that's a 0. So we could go down the whole line, but for now, I'll do fine with just this information. So we know it's a C and then a 0, and then, so, and then a, uh, we'll see what happens next. So now I'll run through that in GDB and show you guys exactly how it works with, uh, like how the program works. Now you can see what patterns happen in GDB. So I can say start, register dog contains some random shit, we don't really care too much about what happens now, it's just calling print, uh, calling a scanf, it'll say enter the password, we'll say C O A A. Now we can see, if we look at our buffer, say uh, give me one string byte uh, at buffer, buffer is, and uh, we can see here 0x4040404040, zero four zero four zero four zero four zero four zero. that's 140 too much, it'll say zero C0 A A A. Uh, we'll call string length, and we can see in RAX that our string has a length of 5. That's not what we want, it'll compare it to 9, it'll see it's not true, jump to fail, print the incorrect message, and it'll quit. Uh, I saw my commute, any questions? No? Alright, sick. So now we know that the length has to be 8. Or uh, nine. So we're gonna say C uh, or next instruction a bit. Step into we gotta tell an enter and the next instruction a bit. So we're gonna see C O oh, one two three four five six seven eight nine. Now it's gonna go on call string length, and here we can see R A X now contains zero X nine. And when we compare zero X nine to zero X nine or just nine to nine, it will not jump to fail, which is great. Then we're gonna set our B X and our C X to zero. That's just for uh, 
for needless sake, so I can show you guys this a little bit better. Uh, it will compare REX to 9, it's not yet, obviously, because it's currently 0. It will move the address of buffer. Um, okay, these two are a little bit off. So, as you can see here, this is the one you should be trusting. It has already moved the address of buffer to R9 and the address of key into R8. So here we can see um, buffer is here and key is here. And then it will move, the next assignment is move the byte uh, of R9 plus Rx times 1 into BL. And we can see that RBX. And that, that is also uh, real quick if... Um, oh. If all of these values are zero, so it's like zero, zero, uh, zero, 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 uh, zero XFF, then it will it will be literally the same as just uh, zero, uh, FF. So that's why you can see um, the byte properly, even though we're reading RBX instead of just uh, BL. So we can see, okay, that was moved into there. Then uh, that is our. Oh yeah, that is our uh, byte from Koa, and now we're gonna move the byte from our um, uh, from our key into our CX. We're gonna XOR BL with the key, and then you'll see we'll get two A and two A in memory. So it's gonna compare them. It's not gonna jump to fail because um, it's not f incorrect. It's gonna increment RAX so you can see RAX is one now, and then jump back into the loop. Then out back at the beginning of the loop, it'll do the same. Check it with 9, it's not. Move one byte into memory. Uh, move the bytes into memory. You can see it's got 0x30, 0x59. It'll XOR it now. Then it'll change it to both 0x59. Compare it, it's correct. Um, so it will jump back to uh, the loop. However, this time it's going to do it again. It just XOR it. But you can see now it is actually 8 instead of 7. So we know it is not correct. And it will uh, jump to fail, and it is, uh, yeah, we have failed, and it will go wrong, and it will leave. Okay, so now we got a little bit of an understanding of uh, the program itself. Let's just write a script real quick that will uh, break it. So this is going to be just a little bit of Python magic. doesn't really matter that much for assembly. So we're going to say, um, give me the character of... Um, the our current value xor 0x69 4x in 0x2a 0x uh, 0x59 0x in I made a few mistakes. Why is it saying that? Um, there we go, that should be 0x3 or uh, E. Uh, 1b 0x5d. So that should be correct. Oh, yeah. Um, another closing bracket woo and it will give the password namely congrats exclamation mark so now if we run out with congrats exclamation mark it'll say we are correct all right so that has been an intro to assembly um take two for the people who missed the first one are there any more questions Uh, you, go, you go first. Okay, so when I'm when I'm in VI uh, in a in a thing, I do colon wq, and you can see that in the bottom left corner, this is what I'm typing colon wq, and that's save and quit. X. Today I learned that works too. I'm not sure if that's safe though. But if it does, that... Ah, uh, okay. Well, then it's probably just a shortcut for uh, WQ.
Yeah, you have to insert. So press I first and then you can type. So here you can see in the bottom it just says in line 77 character 1146. I press I, then I'm in inserting and then I can like uh, actually type stuff. Uh, program name. Oh, the file I'm editing. Um, I here do vi in.s, and that just means I'm editing in.s. Um, vi will do that for you. If you wanted to, you can with touch. So if I say touch, the, uh, it is now a file that exists on the left here. Uh, but I don't need it, so I'm going to remove it. Uh, I may say it's A. Uh, but yeah, if you just do VI, and it will, it will create it. Any other questions? Colon? Yeah, yeah, you gotta press escape first to get out of insert. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No, alright. Well, I presume that will conclude my second session of an intro to assembly. Um, I will upload this one to YouTube. Um, I'll... Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'll get Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it should be uh, here. Uh, this. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm gonna open Excel here and make a little bit of a, my own improvised stack. And this is really uh, useful if you guys haven't watched the. Um, let me just go down a bit. If you guys haven't watched the uh, my stack video yet. So um, here we've got RBP and RSP, which is our, our stack pointer and the base pointer. We set those equal at the beginning. And what it does is um, when you pop a, uh, push a value to the stack, it'll put that right here. So uh, say, for example, I push the value 4, it'll push that here and move the stack pointer up by 1. If I push 5, it'll push that here, put the stack point up by 1. Now if I, uh, it, it might do that the other way around, or it might, um, this is just the basis that you will need. I'm not exactly 100% uh, an expert on the stack, it's just I kind of understand it. So when you pop something, it will decrease the pointer, and then take this value and give that to you again. However, what they are doing, is instead of um, making an area in the buffer like we are, or in the data segment like we are, they are saying, okay, uh, and by the way, the stack grows to the bottom. So what that means is that this is, um, oh, this is address like 0xFFFF all the way at like the end of memory. And this is 0x0000, that is like top of memory. So what they do is they subtract, what was it again? 16, uh, probably. Uh, let me check. Oh, 8. They subtract 8 from the stack pointer. And that means that whatever space is here, they can now use for their own gain. So let, let me just, let me just move it up a bit. Say they subtract 32. That means that all these four uh, four things are now for them to use because um, the next value that will push on the stack will be over here. So all of the uh, and they basically just create some space on the on the stack that they can use and they they will uh, beneath oh, beneath that they will use uh, LiaQ which uh, sounds like a tongue breaker, but it's actually load effective address and then Q for quad, that's it's the amount of bytes. And that will, um, what this here does is it says, uh, this like minus eight opening bracket percentage RBP closing bracket, that is like the value at RBP minus eight. So uh, RBP minus eight would be uh, this one here. And 
uh, instead of giving them the value of that, they're LIA, so load effective address. So they're loading the address of this value, whatever would it be, 0xFFFA. They're loading that value into, um, into uh, what is it, RSI. So that scanf can take this, these 8 bytes that they just freed up and just write whatever they want in here. So they're basically using the, the memory, like just the stack as a temporary buffer um, by moving up the stack pointer. However, I wouldn't do that. I would just stick to uh, using buffer at the top of your program. Because at the end you have to make sure everything aligns again. And um, if you do this incorrectly, you will get uh, segmentation errors that are really hard to explain. So what I would just say is stick to... Uh, oh, stick to... Bleh, stop fucking... RSP. Stick to just pushing and popping values. Whenever you push something, make sure you pop it later. And that means in the end your program will always be... Um, correctly aligned and you will not get any shitty ass segmentation errors because of uh, because of the way your stack is aligned and that's like you will pull your hair out over that shit it's like it, it can uh, I've had an error before and it will took, it's taken me like what three hours to fix so yeah just only stick to pushing popping don't manually interact with the, the stack pointer for now though however um, there is something where hmm? Uh, well, right now it's preparing the address of uh, the stack minus 8. This is uh, incorrect, by the way. The stack minus 8 is this. But the stack minus 8 into uh, the register so that it knows I can write at this address. So instead of writing this address, you could just write the address of your buffer. And that's something that, um, that actually I can show real quick. This is also still kind of important. Uh, assembly scanf. Uh, scan print in the s so now if I edit this I've mentioned before that this uh, will give the address of the buffer however there's also a way to get the uh, content of the buffer so here if I say um, move buffer without a dollar sign into rex it will actually move whatever we have entered into rex uh, in that case I, it is probably better to use percentage d so we can enter a number and then uh, say that number, but um, then we can also say move our uh, our AX into RSI. So basically what we're doing here is we're still scanning something into the buffer, in this case a number with percentage D, and then we're moving the content of, that, of the buffer, so that will now contain our number into REX, then we're moving REX into RSI and that will format it. So that will format it using the uh, thing. I've seen a lot of people do this. Saying move the address of the buffer into REX, RSI, whatever. And then you will print something like 0x401122. Which is the address of the buffer but not the content. So if you're doing this, be sure to um, do it without the thing. And now we can also say for example sub uh, REX by 1. I think the syntax of that is 1, rex. Let me check. Um, yeah. So if you make a mistake and like uh, accidentally switch a rule around uh, some things, I think this should give an error. Yeah. It'll say operand type mismatch for sub. And that basically means your operands are either the wrong type or the wrong order or whatever. So when I compile it like this and I run out, I can give it a number like uh, 255. And it will subtract one from that, and that's that's basically what uh, what this is doing. So this is how you can like get uh, input a number and uh, use that to uh, use the number itself. And it's probably the way you're going to be doing it as well in the um, Power Program. Okay. Um. Yeah, if you don't understand the stack itself, it is really not worth it to use the stack. Like, if you understand the stack, you can totally do it. If you don't understand the stack, just stick to push and pop. 
which is still really useful. That is something else I need to address real quick, by the way. Um, functions like printf and scanf will edit a lot of your buff of your uh, registers. So here, for example, um, I will gdb into the program, start, step into, uh, next instruction. So I can say like some values here. So here you can see uh, the, uh, the last thing that changed was RDI and there's a lot of other random stuff in here. When I now press enter, it's gonna print it, but it's gonna edit a lot of buff, uh, a lot of registers. So REX changed, RDI changed, RSI changed, R8, R9, R10, R11. Um, so it changes a lot of ver uh, variables. And that's why it's really good to have GDB, but you gotta be careful um, with like variables uh, or uh, registers that you wanna preserve. There are some color preserve or uh, Kali saved register, I think they're called. Um, and that's like RBP R, um, and R12 to R15. So if you want to save something, move it to R12 before a call and back out of there, or push it on the stack and pop it. So an, exa an example would be vin.s. Uh, Yeah, Lucas, bitte, bitte. Yeah, always set to serve me, people. But if they don't, if they're not there, yeah, you can't do much. So, for example, say I have the value uh, zero eight six nine six nine six nine into um, our, I don't know, uh, CX, and I now call. Uh, oh, this is a mistake I often make. I just added in dot f, but I didn't compile yet, so my changes are not saved. Okay, now I can uh, I can look at GDB uh, out. Uh, I can say start, step into an extraction. One, two, three, five. So here, um, direct six nine six nine six nine is pushed into uh, RCX. Then I call printf, and RCX is now changed. My f my variable is no longer there. This is something that fucked me up. So what you can do is uh, even when you don't free space or anything. You can say push RCX and then pop RCX afterward. So now I can do compile out. That wasn't supposed to happen. So let me see what went wrong there. So when I do start, I go next, uh, step into next instruction. This is good, you guys can see how I debug. I'll enter a number. Uh, it that number gets moved. So here I will push RCX onto the stack. You can see here the number 0869669 is on the stack. And now we'll call printf. And I'm guessing it's gonna um, mess up somewhere during the printf. There we go. I'm gonna be honest, I don't quite know what's causing this. Yeah, I was about to say, maybe it's because REX isn't zero. Good call. So if I now put the zero in REX, I compile it and I run it, it should, there we go. Good call, you're sharp. So, now I guess, mm -hmm. no, a register is um, eight bytes of memory, tiny memory inside your CPU that makes it really fast to interact with it. But basically that means that, um, all you will have in that register is that uh, that one value, that's like zero or whatever. So now, if we look at this, um, we can say start, step into an instruction, um, and we can see. Okay, now we have zero x sixty nine six nine six nine on RCX. We push it on the stack to preserve it. You can now see in the stack as well here wh uh, what's going on. And then we will call printf, which will print the number that we wanted. It doesn't show up now because there's no enter behind it. But now RCX is gone. And then by popping it back, we can see the value w uh, went away from here and it is back into RCX. So that's kind of how you can preserve your values uh, across the function call. And then here it will leave, return, and there we go. And as you can see here as well, uh, we return 
and then uh, it will go exit for us. So we can either go exit ourselves or uh, just let Lipsy take uh, take care of it. Uh, I have gotten a request. Can you demonstrate some subroutines, please? I very well can. That's a that's a good one. So I'm gonna um, rm in.f and I'm gonna start from fresh. So writing a new program, we've got a text section, we've got a um, we've got to make our main global a global main, um, and I'm gonna put in a um, form of string which is percentage d um, ASCII zero percentage d, and then we can start with our main. So we got our main routine. And what in main will do is first of all we'll enter, really important, and then we will um, move three values into um, into the register that they have to be. So we're gonna make a, a subroutine that will uh, add three numbers. And as per usual, we're gonna make it. This can this doesn't have to be, but I'm gonna make it so that input. Um, RDI uh, number one, RSI number two, RDX number three. And these, uh, this is like the normal way it would go, RDI first input, RSI second input, RDX third input, and then we can say output, and the output will be in RAX, which is uh, number one plus number two plus number three. And this is how I document my code as well. So this is like to uh, when you have a subroutine, uh, this is how I, I do it. So let's say we have a value like five into uh, RDI. We have a value uh, seven into RSI. Uh, SI. We have a value uh, thirteen into RDX. And then we can call add three numbers. Then let's finish this routine real quick. Uh, we've got the output now in RAX. So now we can say move uh, RAX into uh, RSI. We can move um, format string in, or the address of format string, really important, into RDI. And we can call printf uh, move zero into RAX because, yeah, you know, it, it'll happen. And then we can leave uh, return. So here we've got our uh, everything we need for our main function. We've got setting up the parameters of add three numbers. So this will be the same as saying like add uh, three numbers with the parameters five, seven, thirteen in a functional programming language. And this will be the same as uh, print f as a number uh, the return value of uh, add three numbers. Okay, so here we've got everything in the main. The only issue is we don't have a subroutine yet, and that isn't yeah, that isn't yet figured out and done. So, um, well, we want to have the um, for print f, the format string is in the first argument, namely RDI, and the output, like what it's going to be printing, will be an RSI. So the output will be an RAX after our function, because that's what we just defined. We say, okay, the output RAX will be uh, the output. We move the value of RAX, the output, into RSI, and then we clean up RAX so that the printf works. So all in all... Hmm? Uh, all this stuff happens before we print. So the pr call printf is after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no worries. This is like the first time I'm doing subroutines, so I understand it's still a bit rusty. Now this is a subroutine. Get your prologue right. So we start off, enter zero zero. We're not reserving any space, and then we leave uh, return. Okay, so within this, we've got we can do what we want. There's nothing fancy. Uh, there's nothing like extraordinary going on in the background. All this is is a fancy jump that will make sure that we can return. Because um, if you just jump through here, red will cause a segmentation fault. So that's why we're using call. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding RDI, RSI, and RDX. So I'm going to say add uh, RSI and RDX. But before I do that, I'm going to look up what exactly does add do. So here it says add source destination. It means 
the second argument is the second argument plus the first argument. So here we can say uh, rdx equals rdx plus rdi, and we can say uh, R -di, uh, rdi rdx, so this basically means um, this command is rdx is rdx plus rsi, rdx equals RD, uh, rdx plus rdi. So now rdx will contain our final output, which is the three numbers added together. We just make sure to move that to um, our AX because that's what we said. Up here, the output is going to be an RAX, and then we're going to call leave. So if I'm right, there should be no segmentation fault, there should be no bullshit. It will just uh, print the numbers three, uh, 5, 7, and 13 added together. So now we're going to compile. Invalid character is an operand 2. Does this command not work? If I do it like this, maybe. It is line 35. Yeah, that's about that. So if I now compile it. Okay, so apparently the slash slash commands aren't really picked up well if you put them behind something. So just stick to the hashtag commands. So now it's going to print the output of those three numbers combined. Namely, 25. Um... Yeah, okay. Any other requests? Anything you want me to show? Any questions? Any... Uh, yeah, I'll upload um, all of my files uh, to um, to the Yoda's Assembly chalkboard. Wait, give me a sec. Ooh, I'm getting a request for a recursive function. That is gonna be interesting. Uh... <laughs> Um, for for the viewers at home, I'm getting a request for a recursive function. Perhaps we can do Fibonacci. Um, I mean, hmm, the recursive one we have to do is factorial. So Fibonacci. Hmm, I I'm just trying to decide if it's fraud or not, but I'm not giving you the code for for anything, I'm just giving you a code, I'm just showing you how a recursive function happens. Hmm? Yeah, okay, Fibonacci, then we have to, like, work with two different values. Uh, maybe we can make, like, a sum function, that will, that will add all the numbers until, um, uh, from that number to zero. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so first of all, let me, let me save my file in this case by just moving in.s to assembly slash um, what was this again? Subroutine.f And um, on the question, where are these files located? So WSL creates its own, um, yeah, its own kind of like virtual machine. So I d I'm not sure you can access these files from your own, um, from your own like, for example, file viewer here. However, you can access these files uh, or the, um, you can access your own files from the subsystem. So there's this neat little thing where um, I can, for example, copy um, assembly subroutine.s to slash, and slash means the absolute path, for example, C uh, colon in Windows, mount slash C, and now we're just in this uh, C drive of my computer. So I can say users your desktop. And as you can see, it's copied the subroutine.s file into there. So I can just open this and it will ah bright and it will have uh, the entire thing. So this is also how I, how I submit things. Okay so um, I just got a request for a um, recursive function which is gonna be interesting because I've only written one of those but mm -hmm. I'm gonna write a function where if you give like for example a number 5 it's gonna make 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. Yeah. I, um, hmm. Okay, the, the issue is, it is not fraud because it's not exactly what, what you're supposed to be doing. But you can change three variables and you can have your final thing, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I was about to say, I'm like. 
it is really easy to just change the things to that and then copy stuff. Yeah. No. Um, hmm, what do you say? Yeah, yeah, I'll upload that. There is something, however, you, you guys can, um, can keep in mind. So, uh, real quick, I'm gonna copy uh, assembly subroutine.s to in.s. I'm gonna show you guys what the stack looks like when you're calling stuff. So, uh, compile a gdb out, because this is something I was struggling a bit with a bit. Um, so, step into, next instruction, step into. So, here you can see um, the stack just got the, and let me see exactly before I say it uh, incorrectly. Next instruction, or uh, step into. I genuinely have no clue what this is, but I do know that um, before that there was this uh, this main plus thirty, which is the return address where it's going to return back to because that's where we're like the that's where we call to. So, however, if you want to make a recursive function, I'm not going to make an actual recursive function. I'm just going to show you guys how how you would do that. Instead of giving the arguments uh, with a move. You can, uh, you gotta push the argument, so here I, I'll say like push uh, RDI, RSI, uh, I can't do that, push uh, RSI, and uh, push RDX. Now I can GDB out, uh, start, next instruction. I got some comments in my DM saying uh, it is completely different, I'm demonstrating a core concept, and that is correct, however, uh, Fibonacci, uh, a factorial is also such a core concept that I'd rather not risk it. Because it's just like, f f uh, factorial is just the basis of any, um, or like one, one of the easiest programs to make once you understand uh, recursion. And it's like really, I, I just don't want to risk with it or fuck with it. So, where am I? Ooh, I was a little bit too, uh, too hasty on the keyboard. So, I'm already done here. Uh, let me let me try that again. Step into instruction. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you if you look back in the um, in the thing um, in the video I'll post online, it will it will show you how to do it. But basically, I just have like the um, I just have like the GCC file in here um, and I execute that. But you gotta make it executable, so watch it back a bit later. Uh, CH is just an extension that will that stands for like uh, shell script, like bash shell script thingy. So it's like a a dot bot in Windows. It, it, the extension itself doesn't matter. I could write like uh, dot shalala uh, as long uh, yeah, like extensions are just arbitrary ways we've uh, we've given uh, naming to things, but I prefer to keep my naming consistent. So like, yeah, my shell script will have dot sh, my input has dot s. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, the, the compiled as a sh is just a shortcut. So I don't have to type that every time. Okay, so I think actually what is happening here, if when we look here, uh, I push these three values, and then um, I don't pop them anymore anywhere. So my the uh, the compiler actually decided that because I'm not popping these, it literally skips that code in um, in like the runtime. So when it compiles it, it's thinking like, yeah, but I'm pushing these, but I'm not popping them again. So I'm just not gonna do that to make it faster, which is. Uh, Smart, but not what I want. So I'm gonna pop them afterwards. Uh, pop RDI, pop RDI, pop RDX. So, um, let me see if it works now. 
There we go. Okay, so in my disassembly, you can see I'm popping and I'm pushing stuff. So, um, here you can see the values 5, 7, and D, are, and 0xD then, are pushed onto the stack. Now if I am in my subroutine, and I have called my function prolog, that will show here that the stack pointer is now, um, oh, I'm, I was looking at the back phrase, excuse me. The stack pointer is now here, and my first argument is 16 below that stack pointer. And then the second argument is uh, 24 below the, uh, the, and in this case I would use like the base pointer, but either of them works. Um, but yeah, it is 16 below the stack pointer. So you can load the, at the value at 16 below the, the uh, base pointer and the stack pointer into your memory as your, uh, your input. And then when the next one comes, the next uh, stack and recursion comes, you can again see, okay, um, it will be like this again, and then the, the first variable will be 16 under your input. When you're programming the recursion thing yourself, it will make a lot more sense. Um, but just look back at this uh, at this code, what it does and how it influences the stack. Okay, and then we can continue, and it will just do the rest of the program that's done. Uh, I got another question called, when you call scanf, where is the variable stored? Um, well, I explained that a bit already, but I'm, let me explain it again real quick. Uh, scanf, uh, scan So I'm making a buffer here, and what you pass to scanf is the location in memory, in this case, the location, the address of the buffer, um, where it can store things. So that can either be like a location in memory in the stack, it's going to be a location in memory that you've decided yourself, like a buffer, or anything else. At least anything else where it can write. So for example, if you would uh, give the address of main to your uh, to your scanf, it won't overwrite your code because your code is read only. You cannot just edit that. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, don't think I've got any more DMs or anything. Uh, oh, somebody's typing. Oh. Okay, somebody sent me a message saying they missed the the part they wanted to see, but they can um, they can watch back the the vod of it. Or I think that's what he's saying at least. Um. But okay, something about the difference between SI and NI. So um, I've already went over this, but uh, I'll do it again. No worries. So we've got. SI, which means step into. Let me just get uh, my program to a point where it would matter. Okay, so now um, I am on call add three numbers. Now I have two options. I can either SI or NI. And when I do SI, I step into the function, as you can see here, and it will go to the start of that function. And then enter again is a little shortcut, so we can do SI or um, SI to get in here. Otherwise, uh, if I need to do NI, it won't work. But yeah, it goes into this function this way. However, if I start it again, and I go, um, I'm at the same point now, and I go ni, and when I go into it, I will just step over it, and all the magic inside of add three numbers will already have occurred. So when you want to go into the function, use si. If you don't want to go into the function, use uh, ni. And this can be really useful for, for example, when you don't want to walk through the entirety of printf, because you know that, that doesn't really matter. You can just step over that using ni. Because it, it would actually work, by the way. So if I'm I'm now in printf, I can do si. I'm now in printf. Uh, but that should be So I'm just gonna uh, finish, and that will just move me back uh, out throughout the whole function. And then now here I'll say, uh, it does like leave red. And uh, here let's see will give a proper exit. Okay. Um. Uh, I can give a little bit more of a, of a um, uh, explanation about. Hmm? Yeah, I'll get. Uh, well, not exactly variable. You use the buffer when you um, need a, an, uh, a space in memory where you store stuff. For example, you cannot um, read from input directly into a register. Because then, if the register would, uh, if the input would be like more than uh, eight characters long, it wouldn't fit anymore because a, a character or a, a register is only eight bytes. 
So stuff like scanf will will always have to read into some place in memory. That's why you give a memory location to it. Um, okay. Yeah, you usually usually when you're working with strings, you're actually mostly working with um, you're actually mostly viewing it as an array of characters, and then you you. Yeah, you just interact with the single characters within that array. Um, any other questions, or else I'm gonna show uh, show some cool JDB syntax stuff real quick. No, okay, sick. So then I'm gonna uh, cp. Uh, let's see what's in this file again. Uh, not as. Oh yeah, this is a subroutine file, but then with some added stuff. So I think the assembly slash subroutine. Uh, yeah, that's got the same stuff. So I can do arm in .f. I can copy as assembly ctf dot s to in dot s, and I can. Uh, so this is still like the good old um, the uh, the ctf that we just uh, did together, where we had uh, like to find out that this was the password. Uh, but I wanted to show something real quick. So um. Let me see, let me just walk through that scanf and say uh, AAA BBBB CCC. Okay, so now we can, uh, I'll give some more information about this command. Um, let me just give an example of it first. Okay, so this command, the X slash, means show me the memory at location. And then there's three parameters that you're giving it. Namely, a number, which is the amount of whatever you want. Then uh, an S, an X, or something. Uh, can somebody mute? Yeah, either Alex on mute yourself. Oh, yeah, there we go. Awesome. So the um, the second one is uh, for what in what way you want to show your stuff. So here I'm showing it as a string. I can also show it as a hexadecimal bytes. Then I have to like give it a few more. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, I made a mistake. I said H. That's not correct. It's X for hexadecimal. So here you can see the hexadecimal bytes of, um, of the stuff. So it's A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 uh, and then a zero byte to say, okay, it stops here. Um, you can also take a look at bigger things than bytes. You can say, uh, give me 16 hexadecimal uh, words. And words are 32-bit values, so like the stuff you use in EAX, so like basically four bytes. Trixie, um, four one four one four one four one four two four two four two four two four three four two three four three. Um, however, um, there is some interesting behavior in um, when it comes to memory that uh, that is going to be really useful to know about um, when you're working on uh, assignment three. So I'm going to point it out real quick. So if we look at the string, uh, one string in bytes, and you gotta you gotta say um, in bytes when it comes to the string to say each character consists of one byte, because there's also other formats like Unicode where each character is multiple bytes, but we we don't do that, we don't do that around here. So we just have uh, one string byte uh, at that location. It will say A B C D E F G H. So now if we say uh, give me eight hexadecimal bytes. It will be Zurich 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. And that's logical because these are like the A is the 41, B is 42, etc. But now, what do you guys expect us to say if I do the um, the E thing again, where I group four bytes together? Or the, uh, is that E? No, it's W. Like words, like, uh, like I did up there, where we'll group four bytes together. Okay, yeah, people muted themselves. It's logical that they don't get an answer. But the, uh, what people would expect would be 0x4142434. But it is actually the other way around. And that, that has to do with endiness of a system. So basically, in the way we read bytes. Um, but if it would consider this uh, these numbers as one big number, it would read from like 4321 so this might be something that messes you up when you're working on assignment 3, where you have to um, read stuff from memory. 
So yeah, keep this in mind, and when you don't, uh, when you cannot get out of assignment three, um, use this tool a lot. Use uh, inspection of memory, see where you're going wrong, loop through the the memory, see what's going wrong with your registers. But yeah, it's it's really, really, really powerful, especially if your code does something different than you expect. You can you can stare into, until your uh, at your code until you're a hundred, but the code won't change. All it will change is their behavior, and uh, the behavior if it's, if it's different from what you expect, you can see that in GDB. Uh, I've got a message. Let me see. Where can we find the video? I will post a link to the video on um, on the uh, Jure assembly chalkboard, but. Uh, I'm, this is going to be like video one in a series where I've already made and uploaded video two and video two will be the um, the video about the stack that I talked about earlier. Um, yeah, so I think that's uh, that's it for now. Are there any, are there any other questions? Uh, I'm already in GDB, yeah. Oh, um, no, I don't think so. Um, I got a question from a viewer. Uh, is there anything here that I don't want people to see? Nope. All right. So, um, I they asked. I got a bit confused about input and output. I didn't understand what you said about the buffer. Is the input saved in register twelve? Uh, twelve like this, and they're using the um the stack pointer thing again. Here, I would again uh, recommend to watch the other video. Um, that I uh, that I already made and uploaded, but it's uh, in, in the assembly chalkboard channel. However, I would really just recommend to use a buffer. It's a lot less confusing than um, than using the stack. Then you gotta edit the stack pointer to make sure your stuff isn't overwritten when you push stuff. You gotta load the effective address instead of just loading the address of the buffer. It's I don't know. I just don't prefer it. I prefer just using memory over the stack. Which, fun fact, by the way, the, the stack is nothing more than just a bunch of memory. So it's just like a specific area of memory that is that people uh, that like a compiler says, hey, this is used for the stack, but it's just plain old memory. So it's not faster or slower than using a buffer. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Um. Oh, I got a message. Um, maybe you explained before I joined, but how do you compile and run code that you wrote in Visual Studio? All right. Um, with Windows Subsystem and Linux, using external editors like Visual Studio and um, and I don't know VS Code, it sucks. Basically, what you would have to do is um, every time you start up Windows Subsystem for Linux, you'd, you'd have to go to the wherever you save your sh uh, your stuff in uh, Visual Studio. So for example, I would say I would uh, use Notepad here as my go-to uh, assembly editor. And I would, uh, I, I don't know, let me just quickly copy paste the program. Ah, for what? From my thing, uh, assembly, scan of printf, uh, yoink, yeet. And I would save that on my desktop as a uh, scan print, uh, scan print dot s. That would mean every time I would work or I would like start my terminal, I would have to manually go to where my um, where my files are stored. So in this case, mount c users your desktop, and then here I would have to probably already have made a compile, but then I would have to uh, compile it like that. In this case, I would have to do like gc no i g o out uh, scan of print f print s. And th this warning, you can get that. It it'll say like, there is no enter at the end of a file. Okay, there you go. Um, that's just like a little bit, little bit of needles thing. So if you insert an enter, that will, uh, that will do that. And then you can run stuff from like other directories or directories like in your Windows drive as well. Uh, however, I would really advise to pick up VI. It's not the most beginner friendly, but all you need to know is the um, 
the uh, insert escape. Uh, I don't know what the hell this is. Uh, insert escape to get out of the insert mode. WQ, and yeah. If if you want to know more stuff about it, you can Google shortcuts. But this is like all you really need to know. And it's a lot less hassle than having to move every time because now if I quit and I start Kali again, I will be back at my uh, at my home slash username, which um, yeah, that's that's like the default directory where you get when you start uh, when you boot up uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux or any uh, SM or uh, Linux system in that matter. Are there any other questions? Uh, no. Hmm. No, I, I, I think there's no left. If there are, feel free to send me a message in uh, DMs. I've helped over thirty-five people already. You can be next. Um. And with that, I thank you all for listening. The video will be in the, um. In the in the Discord and. I hope you all have a, a great day and all I can say to you is don't give up yet. You'll get there. And have a good day.